Testing one, two, let's go. Grace and peace, y'all. How you doing today? Greg here, Bible Hacker. Um, it's been a minute, um, but I've been, I came out of church today and I thought it was a, would be a good opportunity to kind of just drop something on you here. So right off the gun, let's call this a review. Let's call this a sermon review. Review, use that term very lightly because I'm not really going to critique it per se. I'm just going to comment on it. Um, today in church, um, our the speaker, which was Jada Edwards, um, gave a phenomenal message, um, and I'm going to link that below in the description, probably even put it up here somewhere. Definitely go and look at the message first. It's a short message, 40-ish minutes or something like that. Um, and it is an unusual message, and I think very timely for um, the culture and kind of what we're going through right now, um, or what we're about to go through at the beginning of 2023. I think there is a prophetic aspect to um, this message of the timeliness of it. So walked into church and um, see up on the screen once the message starts after the worship, etc. cetera. Um, you know, today's sermon is going to be about Jeremiah 28 and 29. Fear strikes my heart um, because, you know, there's that very well-known oft misused verse that's lingering around in there. You know, I know my plans for you, plans to see you do great, etc. cetera. Um, so, you know, I was like, oh my God, I hope, you know, that's not where we're going. Please to tell you, spoiler alert, speaker did not go there at all. The verse was taken sweetly into context, explained really well. Um, so it was just, it was phenomenal. Well, extremely well. The text was really respected and well handled, which is an important trait for when you're studying the Bible. You don't ever want to take the Bible out of context and take, take bits and pieces and twist it to, to what you want it to mean. You want to inspect what the author initially intended by the text and then see how that's applicable to you. That's called a hermeneutic circle. That's a good practice for interpreting the Bible and listening to, you know, the, 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 when, for your own Bible study. On that note, I thought it would be interesting to delve a little bit deeper into what that theme looks like throughout the Bible. So we're going to jump into the scripture right here, there. Oops, wrong one. There. There you go. So let's start here. So the scripture, you know, part of it that we were talking about, Jer Jeremiah 29, obviously, um, you know, this was a part where, um, you know, the people were in exile and the speaker today speaks about exile. The only part I want to focus on for our talk today is this part right here. So Jeremiah 29, um, verse um, six and seven, kind of. So tail end of verse six, the highlighted part, grow in number, do not dwindle away. Work to see that the city where I have sent you as exiles enjoys peace and prosperity. Pray for that city, and for as it prospers, you will prosper. So this was God's decree, and he told them, he told children of Israel, basically, you're going to be in exile, and elsewhere it says you're going to be in exile for 70 years. This was a counter-popular message where the, the popular prophets were saying, oh, you're going to be there for two years, and God is going to you know, defeat them, and you're going to be back home. And then Jeremiah comes out the, the jump and says, no, no, actually, I think you're going to be there for 70 years. God says you're going to be there for 70 years. And while you're there, do this. So grow in number, don't dwindle away, and prosper. You know, do well. It, it goes further. It says plant gardens, build houses, settle down, uh, marry, have sons and daughters. Like, really, do well and grow. Um, that theme, I thought, was very interesting. <clears throat> So I went and dug around and where to try to find where else does this theme of do well and grow reappear. First place I found it was in Genesis 1.27. God created humankind in his own image. From the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. This was God's initial purpose 
for humankind. Um, a book that I'm, uh, I'm rereading right now, uh, I'm not going to get too deep into that book right now, talks about the importance of creation. So I've been finding a lot of value in drawing back to see the purpose of creation. Why did creation happen? This was God's purpose for humanity. God blessed him and said, be fruitful and multiply. As we know, at some point shortly after Genesis 1, particularly Genesis 3, there came the fall. The fall led to Noah's Ark, the flood, etc. God had to kind of you know, start over and, and you know, blow the earth away, so to speak, and start over with a remnant. And surprise, surprise, what do we see after the flood when Noah comes off of the ship? God tells Noah again, then God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. So even post fall, that theme of we need you, to, your, your design, your purpose is to subdue the earth, to fill the earth, to be fruitful and to multiply. And we can take that literally, make a lot of kids. You can also take that spiritually or a, 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 in an application to say, make more of your own kind. So you're a Christian, you have a belief system, you believe in Yahweh, you're loyal to Yahweh, make more that are loyal to that. That's our duty, whether you have actual kids or whether you are influencing people in the workplace, business place, in church, in life groups, etc. This is your purpose. Make others that also see, that also are loyal to Yahweh. So again, pre-flood, post-flood, this is God's purpose. Fast forward, when is the first time recorded that the Bible actually acknowledges that humans were obedient to this, 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 this purpose, and they actually started doing it. And I found that, and that was in Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1, for the context, um, this is slavery time. Um, the children of Israel are now captive, and they're enslaved in Egypt, um, and this is the situation we find. Um, all the people who were des descended from Jacob numbered 70, but Joseph was already in Egypt, and at that time, Joseph and his brother, and all that generation died. The Israelites, however, were fruitful, increased greatly, multiplied, and became extremely strong so that the land was filled with them. This is the first time in the biblical narrative up to this point that we see the children of God, God's creation, humanity, actually obey this notion or this idea to multiply, be fruitful, and increase greatly. And where is it? It is in captivity. I thought that was so, 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 so interesting. The first place that we see the actual obedience to it, because prior to this, you have the Tower of Babel where they're saying, you know, we're not going to spread. We're going to congregate at Babel. And, you know, you, you see a lot of pushback against humanity doing this. Hence, it's interesting to me that when we loop back around to Je Jeremiah 29, where once again, children of Israel are in exile, in tough situation, in a spot where they probably don't want to be, and listen to the sermon for, um, that, that I'll link below, and you'll, you'll, you'll delve deeper into this, and still God's mandate or command to the humans is grow in number, do not dwindle away, Work to see that the city where I send you as exiles enjoys peace and prosperity. On that note, that's been today's Bible hack. Study your Bible, read it, understand it, apply it to your life. That's what Bible hacking is all about. That's what the Bible is all about. That's what fuels our lives. I hope this was beneficial. See you guys around. Later.